Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Talk with Ali Lepage. That's me, the place where we choose the challenge of life and the thrill of fulfillment. Guys, we seek opportunity, not security. We want to take calculated risks, to dream and build, to fail and succeed. We face the world boldly and chase our dream. We're going to talk about real estate, obviously, business and mindset, because guys, it's all related. But I'm especially here to get the real stuff. I'm going to sell you only one thing, and that's the fact that it's possible. That's it. Guys, welcome to the show. And I'm super excited because I have a great guest for you. And it's not far away. It's a guy from Buffalo that I met in an event. And I was like, man, I have to talk to you. Yeah, it's awesome what you're doing. You might have seen his face if you're a HGTV fan or if you're from the area. And without further ado, Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited. Great, great. So I, I was listening. I was actually doing some research, getting to know you. And we actually, we talked before uh, and I've, I, I was hearing your story and it, it's amazing. Like you've always had this, like this touch of entrepreneur. I, I, I heard that you started, you were around what, 16, 17. Yeah. And um, you had a, a shop, uh, what, it was clothing shop. Or yeah, we had a, a skateboard a snowboard shop called Fat Man Board Shops. That's awesome. So you always had, you always had this entrepreneur idea and then you kind of like accidentally stumble upon real estate. Uh, am I right? It was sort of an accident. I'm just like, well, this one person said, oh, you should flip a house. I'm like, yeah, I should flip a house. And voila, flipped the house. And that was the first one was in 06. In 06. Great. So you started then. And uh, can you tell me about that? Like what, what happened in that first deal? I like How yeah, did you so, stumble on that and uh, getting to like, uh, how did you get the deal and the numbers? So it's interesting because at that time I, I had started my first company at 16. I grew up in a lower, I call it a lower middle class family, but my wife would say that I grew up poor. So it's either poor or lower middle class, whichever way you perceive it. And if I wanted something, I always had to, I had to hustle. I had to go out there and work for it. So it started working yeah. on a farm at 14, 16. I, wow. I decided to uh, quit my job because they treated me so poorly. Every day I'd go into work, they made me feel like I couldn't accomplish anything. I couldn't do anything right. And you know, when you're told that so many times, you, you bring it home with you. Yeah. So I'd bring that idea of I'm useless. I'm, I can't do anything right home and it started affecting me so I quit and I quit trading hours for dollars and that's when I became an entrepreneur I started a clothing line in mom's basement that was at 16 I had a, a big goal to be a pro snowboarder so on that journey to being a pro snowboarder I, I landed in a lot of different things but uh, ended up wanting to open my own shop and I did that uh, And I, I had no money. So I went around, did what everybody else does when they need money. It's 17 years old. Hey, do you got some money? Hey, can you collateralize this loan? And I heard no, no way. And hell no. And then I finally got a yes from the person I call awesome. the unconditional one. And that person just by was, hustling. Huh? Yeah. Just, just going out there and hustling. But that unconditional one was my mom, but my mom didn't have any money. She, she didn't have anything to give me and I needed 70 grand. But what she did have is the house that she got in the divorce. Uh, my dad, I grew up with my dad. He's a great man, but he was an alcoholic my entire life until last year when he almost wow. died. He hasn't touched alcohol since. So that's a huge victory. But My mom put her house on the line so her crazy 17-year-old punk snowboard kid could chase his dream and open Fat Man Board Shops, and that's where it began. So long story short, did the stores for 16 years, and in the early 2000s, hit some hard times when the planes hit the towers here in the States. My businesses came way down. I mean, my business oh, yeah. plummeted. And at that time I had to make some decisions, and I decided to get a part-time job. That was my mindset get a part-time job. So I was either going to deliver pizzas or I was going to go out and I was going to find something else. And I landed in the life insurance world. I was selling life insurance, which turned into oh, really? a financial advisory business and really kind of turned into an amazing practice, an amazing career that I ran while doing my stores. But how that all happened is after that point in time, I was running my stores. I went on to be a pro snowboarder. So everything was clicking along pretty good. And then I decided in... Uh, 2006 that I was going to flip a house. I had a little extra cash. I had some money in my life insurance policies and I'm like, what the heck, let's flip a house. And it started much like many others first flip starts. You get the idea. The deal yeah. was brought What to me. Did by, you get the idea? Yeah. Exactly. 
because well, uh, the idea, I can't remember. Someone planted the idea. I don't know yeah. where I got it. I was just like, I'm just going to flip a house. It sounds fun. And because 06, it really wasn't a super popular sounds fun, thing. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds fun. Sure. And uh, a realtor found me a deal and she brought me that deal. It was this raggedy old farmhouse out in the was small it uh house. was it a pocket listing uh, or was it on mls it was on the mls but it was uh it was a bank foreclosure so okay. the house had been vacant for years and i didn't know any different i'm like hey the uglier the better right yeah. so the price was right we negotiated the price and we ended up getting close to the time when we had to close and this is when i really started learning like i didn't know what i didn't know i didn't know how money really worked i thought at that time so you true. could go to a bank and you could just borrow all the money for the deal and maybe put in like five, 10%, right? Because that's what I had done with my primary house. So I thought, why can't this work for a real estate deal? Well, it didn't work that way. I went to the bank, they put it through underwriting. And the next thing I found out is they're only going to give me 80% of the purchase price. And I'm like, whoa, guys, whoa, hold on a second. No, 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 no. No. Remember when you loaned me money to buy my house? I only yeah, needed exactly. 5%. I'm like, what about that? Oh, well, Mr. Noggle, you're, you're not living in this house. This is an investment property. I said, yeah. I and they see. said, well, we only loan 80% on purchase price. So I now had like a couple of weeks left. I had to scramble and find money. And it basically, same thing, back to asking everybody if they'd have money. Nobody would give me money for it because I'd never done a real estate deal. So I maxed out my credit cards. I took the max loans I could from my life insurance. And it got me into the house. It got me started in the renovations. And just like everybody else, day one, demo day. And demo day started with a sledgehammer and pretty much everything in that house came down. Because I just thought, hey, we're going to redo it all anyway. No big deal. Let's rip the whole thing down. Well, when that happened, I realized, wow, this is going to cost a lot of money to put this back together. Oh, yeah. So, so where, uh, I'm going to stop you here just for a second. Where was your mindset? I mean, you put it all in. Basically, you went like all in credit card money, you know, uh, love money uh, from people around you and ev everything you had, you put into one deal. So it was an all in bet. So where was your mindset? What would you think about that? Did you think about the risk or anything? Or were you just like, let, I was go and without thinking. I was a little scared because I was all in, but at that time I had my stores going, I had my financial advisory practice going, I was making six digits there. So I had income. So even though I was all in, I still had income to live on. So I wasn't okay. super nervous, but I was still nervous. Like, hey, how am I going to finish this house? Where's the money going to come from? And literally what it ended up being is every paycheck. I'd pay the contractors out of my pocket, every paycheck. It just kept going like that. And it took me a year to get the darn thing done. And I was supposed to profit 35 grand, right? So my insignificant numbers that I ran back then, I scratch patted them. I'm like, I got it. I'm going to make 35 grand. And I always ask people when I speak on stage, I'm like, what do you think I actually made? Well, probably zero. I made eight grand, which eight was, grand. Well, which yeah, is eight, better than zero then, right? Put your hands together for that. So at that time, that eight grand might just as well have been 80 grand because it gave me hope. And it also let me know that it is possible to make money. And that's exactly. kind of where real estate started for me. There you go. And that's exactly what I said to everybody. Hey, if you make some money on your first deal, that's, that's really good because most of the people like they don't do the calculation very well they they forget so much thing so if you make money on your first deal and you're probably going to make a lot of mistake and the best thing is actually you're going to get so much learning from that so much and i like a lot of people are afraid to fail and a lot of people are afraid to make a move and like how did you handle it wasn't a fail for you actually but it was kind of risky but you were talking talking about um, the fact that your your store plummeted and um, how did you take it and how did th that failing like got got into you yeah I mean I, I failed so many times in my life I mean it, um, just life has never been easy nothing I've ever done has ever come easy to me so it's always been life of you know hearing no over and over and over again until I get a yes so I was always that kid that was persistent and consistent until I got the answer I wanted and I just never wanted to accept the word quit besides quitting trading hours for dollars I never wanted to quit so I just kept going forward with that and so fear is always part of it right I mean yeah. no matter I don't care how how confident you are. I don't care how much money you have. You're always going to have fear. It's just part of almost everything you do, especially when it's new. Like this was a new venture for me. So of course I was scared. And there was a lot of times during that process where I felt like that house was never going to get done. And I was scared. And then we put it on the market and it didn't sell right away. You see, when we did this house and we got it all done, I'm like, oh, it's going to sell in a day. Well, it didn't sell in a week. 
it didn't sell in a month. It didn't sell in a month and a half. I'm freaking out. Yeah, like, probably. I was scared out of my mind. I'm like, holy cow, this is a massive mistake. But then it went under contract and we ended up closing on that house. And at that time, I mean, fear was gone once the deal closed, even though yeah. my insignificant calculation said I'd make 35 and I made eight. It didn't matter because I did it. I succeeded awesome. in my goal and that was to flip that house. And, and from there, you know, I, I did one other house up until 2008 and it wasn't a very good one either. I think we made 15 grand on that one. But um, so I had had two under my belt, but 08 was kind of my big telltale time. Uh, in 08, everything was clicking along. Everything was good. I had my financial advisory stuff going. My retail stores were going. I was doing really, really how well. You, Chris, how did you handle like having a store, uh, financial advisory business, Plus flipping, how did you end all your time? I mean, did you have friend? What was going on? Did you have hobby in that time? Were you still? Well, I was a pro snowboarder, so in the winter times, that's what I did, and in the summer, on top I did of a lot. That. Yeah, so on top of all this, so how did I handle it? Well, you know, here in the states, we call it stress. I don't know what you guys call it, but that was how I handled it. A lot of stress. I was literally Probably. always stressed out. I, you know, my friends would always go out and they'd have fun, and I spent a lot of times just working weekends working, yeah. overtime, nights working. I mean, that's just what I did. I hustled. I didn't know any different. I, I, I didn't have a backup plan. It was, you know, kind of like, hey, I burned the boats at the beach. Like now it's just either conquer or die. I didn't have any other choice. So that was what I did. I just kept failing forward. And, you know, I, and I'm just getting warmed up here. Like nothing is bad has really even happened besides a couple of minor little fall on my face kind of things. You know, if you tie your shoelaces together and you try to walk, you fall, but you can get back up. But I got hit really, really hard in what happened next. Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell me. I want to hear. So, that. 08. I mean, in the States, we had a major, major financial major crash. It probably hit recession. your region like really bad because you're Buffalo. If people don't know where it is, it's just south of Toronto and close to Detroit, which was a really, really, really badly hit area. Yeah. Everywhere in the United States was hit bad. Everywhere, and, I mean, yeah. it was, it was, it was chaos. I mean, but honestly, yeah, I mean, in Montreal, we didn't see anything. Nothing happened. Honestly, it was just the market was like still for from 2000. It was actually it was still going up till 2012. And then it went still till 2017. So I remember seeing insane. that. I remember during that period of time, just like being like, why is Canada not having any issues? Like you were one of the only ones. I mean, everybody else felt the ripple effects of the United States is crash and and but how mine happened let me get back to to kind of what actually happened in my life in early 08 actually late 07 into 08 i i had my retail stores going and at that time my lease was coming due in my store so i had a choice I either renew my lease and my landlord wanted to bump my rent way up or two buildings down was a dilapidated paint store and i'm a visionary so i looked at that thing and i'm like you know what that's my new home i'm gonna buy that building i'm gonna convert it into a three unit commercial plaza. Fat man's going to move into the far left, take 4,000 square feet. I'm going to rent the other two. They're going to pay my mortgage and life is going to be good. So I had to go back to the drawing board and I, I put it under contract. I didn't have the money, just like never in my life. I've never had the money, but I was getting good at finding resources. I was getting good at being resourceful because I didn't have the resources. That was my only option is get resourceful. So I started asking around and I found some other people. Mom would have loaned me the money because I paid her the money back on her house, but that she didn't have enough. So I found a guy for the sake of this podcast, I'll call him Knuckles. And he was a hard money lender. And the hard money lender said, sure, kid, we'll give you 340 grand, but don't screw it up. No problem, sir. We got this. I got this under control. That's, and that's risky. Huh? Oh, it's super risky. But what did I care? I was just a punk, you know, well, I wasn't a punk at that time, but I was a snowboarder. So I was pretty fearless. I mean, I just went for it. I want to say that actually it's risky, but it's better to have that risk and seize the opportunity because otherwise you wouldn't have had anything. So correct. I always, you know, I like to, a lot of my speeches are called living life on the edge. And I firmly believe that a lot of people step up to the edge, whether it's the edge of a stage or the edge of a mountain or whatever edge you're on and they look down and they get scared and they step back. Well, some people, me included, step at that edge and I look out and I see the possibility of an outcome or of an opportunity. Awesome. And that opportunity, if I like it, I leap, man. I don't, I don't look twice. I just leap and I figure the rest out on the way down. So that's what I did on this one. I just leaped. And the next thing that happened is, you know, what many listeners would know is 
market crashed. My yeah. retail stores plummeted 30%. My financial advisory business wow. came to a screeching halt. I was working harder than I ever worked and making no money. And I got to the point where I was literally two months away from being completely bankrupt with wow. this plaza, not knowing what Knuckles would do. I mean, I knew he'd take the plaza, but he'd probably take yeah. a couple of fingers. Really old shit. <laughs> so it got, it got down to the wire and I literally went home and I'll never forget this. And I had my girlfriend, my beautiful, she's now my wife, my beautiful girlfriend had just moved into my house and I went home and I looked her in the eye and I said, sweetie, said, things are really bad. said, I need your help. I need you to help me pay the mortgage. Oh, and I also need help paying the utilities. And sweetie, you're not going to like this one, but we have to rent that bedroom over there to our friend Pete because I can't make ends meet. And she could have went running, which she probably should have, but she didn't. She stuck with it and, you know, stuck it out. It was hard. But uh, we ended up getting that plaza leased. We ended up getting it refinanced out of uh, Knuckles' hands. So he got all his money back and, you know, went back on. But things weren't good. Like, you know, it's like, great, we got out of that. We, we avoided bankruptcy there by the skin, uh, you know, just yeah, barely any really. margin of error there. We just got through it. And I remember after that point, I remember sitting in my office kind of just like this, but the phone's ringing off the hook, the bills are piling up. And, and I just, I thought, I'm like, man, this can't be the life I, I, I'm, I'm bound to be on. This can't be what life is about. Like I'm stressed. I, I'm not making any money. I can't do this. I need an opportunity. I need a breakthrough moment. And that breakthrough moment came in a form of a phone call. And it was a broker calling me up with a opportunity. And I said, you know, picked the phone up. I said, you know, Hey, how are you doing? Uh, I said, I'm doing all right. And you know, I said, how are you doing? And he said, I'm doing freaking awesome. This is a great day. I put the phone down. I'll never forget. I put the phone down. I'm like, what a bunch of bullshit. Who's happy right now? Who's energetic? I was miserable, right? You get in that mindset when you're miserable. And when, when you feel like you're failing and you feel like you can't do anything right, and you think everybody else is miserable. So I continued on and he told me about this three unit apartment building, downtown Buffalo in a booming area. It was rent roll positive. Everything was good. And all of a sudden I started getting a smile and I started saying, yes, this is that opportunity. This is what I've been waiting for. And everything was good. I felt energized. I felt like this is going to be the thing that changes it. But I did what a lot of people do. And I, I remember when we did your podcast, we talked about yeah. this. I, I went home and I started asking myself those questions. Well, what if, what if I can't get the money? What if a tenant leaves? What if that area doesn't boom? What if, what if, it's and I, what if mindset, huh? Yeah. I, what if yeah. myself right out of that deal and I didn't do that really? deal. And oh, I didn't realize, yeah, I didn't realize what I lost. Oh this is, remember, this is 09. Uh, several years later, after I got back on my feet, I, I was buying apartment buildings at that point. I, I was down in that area and I drove by that, that apartment and I looked at it and it didn't look the same at all. It had been completely developed. So I went back, I ran the numbers and I, I remember at that time, I could have bought that in 09 for 180 grand. And at that time, just a few years later, it would have been worth over 400 today. Wow. That would be worth well over a million bucks. So I literally allowed fear to talk me out of over a million dollars. And that was early 2009. Wow. So that was, uh, that was my almost fall on my face. And, and then I continued to fall on my face from nine to 2014. I did really well. I, I was back on my feet. I was buying dilapidated apartment buildings, pennies on the dollar. Cause when we crashed here in the States, real estate plummeted. I mean, penny, you could buy properties 30 cents on the dollar and that's what we were doing. Crazy. But I still hadn't learned how money people was. were scared at that time. I remember everybody was scared. Telling me that, hey, you can Dump buy money like a house for $5,000 or $20,000. Yeah. It was impossible over here. So people were like, wow, there must be but, a scam or there must be something going on. And let me ask you a question that, you know, related to what were you saying? Like, what kept you going like mentally? Like, how were you keeping yourself motivated? And what kept you going? Like, keep hustling, keep trying. Because a lot of people just give up. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, there's, there's no way I can't do this anymore. And I've noticed that people that succeed, they keep going, but you have to have something. That so there's a lot of things. Um, at first start, I'm going to give you multiple answers, but number one, the unwillingness to fail. Uh, I grew up in a household where my mom believed in me. She gave me that opportunity to live my dreams. And now I was falling on my face, but I was still unwilling to fail. I wasn't willing to give up. But the other thing is, is, I remember I used, I got into this habit of reading uh, quotes and phrases from people that I admired. One was from Bill Gates, uh, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. And he yeah. said, if you were born poor, that's not your fault. But if you die poor, 
damn it, that is your fault. And I'll never forget that. I'll yeah, never forget so that. Good. I wasn't willing to die poor. I might have I might have been born in a poor or lower income household, depending on whether you're asking me or my wife, but I'm not dying that way. And I just kept fighting for it. I just kept doing it. And it wasn't easy, man. It was it sucked. That whole period of time sucked. And I remember I got up to 36 units, 36 apartment units, all rented. And I was worth couple million dollars on paper, but I was so freaking broke. I could barely afford the mortgage. I, could, I couldn't even take my wife out to good dinners. I remember we'd pinch pennies on everything. Everything was just like, oh my God, how much was that? How much was that? But you see too, the big takeaway from this is I learned something during this period of time. I learned that because I was in a negative mindset, because I thought I was broke, because I convinced myself I was always broke, that I didn't have money. I did because of that, I didn't have money. But the second thing I didn't do is I had no clue on how money really worked. The way I was getting money for those deals was from the bank. 80 cents, they'd give me 80% of purchase price and I'd come out of pocket for closing costs, for the 20%, for the renovations. So as I kept scaling up to those 36 units, I just went broker and broker and brokest. And then in 14, I hit a breaking point and I sold everything. I, I literally, yeah. so I don't call this quitting because at that point I'm just like, I'm just going to sell everything and we're going to start flipping houses again. And that's what I did. I sold everything and it sold quick, including the strip mall. And I made a lot of money doing that. And that's what seed funded, you know, my wife and, and my flipping business. And that started in 2014. And, you know, I mean, you know the story, but your audience yeah. might not. We've, we've flipped hundreds of houses. We've done just I don't even know. I can't even count anymore. You know, we That's built amazing. wholesale operations. We had construction companies. We, we've built a whole academy where we teach people how to do what we do, a results-based education system. And we've, we've come so far from 14 till now. And we had a big dream in 14 that we wanted a TV show. And we knew nothing about getting a TV show. So what we did is we, we hired a film crew. We filmed the sizzle on one of our flips. We sent it out to producers. Actually, we got picked up by a producer in Toronto. Many of you might know yeah. Buck Productions. He's amazing. He's, he gave us our first opportunity. He couldn't get it placed, so he couldn't get it you know, with the network to take it. And we yeah. heard no, and that was a year of our life. But after that, we already knew there was a possibility. And it's kind of like that, those movies, you know, you're saying there's a chance. So when we came off of that contract, we jumped right into another producer here in the States in LA. And then we ended up getting, you know, the attention of HG and went on to air on HGTV and the show's name was Risky Builders. So that was uh, quite the journey and it was very exciting. But again, you know, we got told no by every network in the beginning. Most people would have yeah. just quit. Uh, you just can't quit. You don't ever give up. Can't quit. And that's it. The biggest thing I always tell people, I tell them all the time is you're going to fail. And if you haven't failed yet, you're not trying hard enough. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. have to fail forward. And every single failure, every failure in your life puts you one step closer to success. And every single no in your life puts you one step closer to a yes. If you live your life with that mindset right there, that simple mindset of every failure, is a necessary thing to get you to success. And every no is just a learning lesson to get you to a yes. If you just remember that, you will never fail at anything because you will never allow yourself to fail. You'll never quit. Yep. The only way you can fail is to quit. That is the only way. Exactly. Exactly. And one thing I love about you and you, to, you just said earlier is actually, you know, the way to structure, the way to use money. And that's one thing that, you, you know, you talk about a lot and you have a book about it. Uh, your podcast is about it, like how to structure a deal, how to use money. And like myself, and like I told you, I, I had no idea, even though I have, like I had flipped maybe um, 50 houses, I didn't know what, what was a hard money lender. Could you imagine? I didn't know how to use money and it took me a while to, you know, <laughs> know how to use it. Uh, like, can you tell me like how do you structure your deal? What's the best way a little bit about what you're teaching, sure. how to use the money wisely? Sure. I mean, and that is definitely my area of expertise is money. I, I don't know why, but from a very early age, I might not have been the smartest guy, but I was always freaking good at money. I always understood how money worked. And when I learned how money worked on Wall Street, being a financial advisor at a high level for 16 years, that I, I learned that side. Then in failing so many times in real estate, not understanding money in real estate, I literally just, I took the knowledge from both sides, from real estate and from being an advisor. And when I left the financial advisory business last year and I sold it, I started taking everything I had learned and I basically, compl I completely did a whole system, a whole structure, the book, 
And the book basically tells people how money works. And here's a couple of simple things is so many people think that they have to have money to get into real estate. That is false. You have that to have a little really bit, false. but you, yeah. you, you might not even need a lot, but you have to have something to get started, but you don't need much because it's about the asset. Yep. It's about your actual ability to be resourceful. The other thing people make a huge mistake on is when they get a deal, they don't analyze the deal in multiple strategies. They get a deal and they're like, I'm going to flip this. Okay. You're going to flip the house. Did you run the numbers? Yeah, I ran the numbers. Well, did you run the numbers to see how much you'd make wholesaling it? Did you run the numbers to see how much you'd make Good if you point. rented it? You should run multiple strategies because if that one deal doesn't work for a flip, let's say you get your house all done and all of a sudden it doesn't sell what you have no other options. You're like, you're, you're dead in the water, but you yeah. always want multiple options. We go four options on every single deal before I even put a property under contract. I know that in the beginning, I'm going to try to wholesale that. If I can't wholesale it, I'm going to run the numbers to flip it. If it can't make 20% profit, then I move on and it's going to be a rental and it, it's, that's it. And then the other model is we'll buy it and we'll just clean it up. We won't even do much. We'll clean the carpets, rip the carpets out, put it right back on the market and wholesale it. So understanding multiple strategies is good because you can never ever just be one strategy and be successful. You have to have multiple strategies. The second thing you have to understand is how money works. And a lot of people, when they get into real estate, they think I got to go to the bank and borrow money. I remember your story. You were using the banks. So that's the big misconception because if you get hung up on using banks, first thing that's going to happen is number one, you're going to come out of pocket a lot more than you should. Number two, there's going to come a time where your debt to income ratio is going to stop you from scaling and building. And, and number three, long, actually. banks change. Yeah. Banks change their lending policies all the time. So one year you might have a great year with that bank. The next year they might be like, oh, well, we're not lending on that type of loan. And you're just like, whoa, wait, I have to. I've got deals under contract. You guys did it last year. And all of a sudden they cut you off. So we have basically mastered the art of finding private money. Money is all around you. I mean, in, in Canada, you guys have retirement accounts, RFPs. Okay. And I said that right, right? Or R, RFP? Uh, honestly. RSP. It's, it's, so employer sponsored. It's, it's in French anyway. So it's, but That's yeah, true. So, retirement account, is, retirement accounts. So I teach people how to use retirement accounts to fund deals without having to pay penalties or taxes. I teach awesome. people how to use life insurance policies. I teach people how to dig in and get the hidden equity in their homes and turn their homes into assets versus liabilities by making it a cash flow positive vehicle instead of something that just costs you money. And we teach people all these different ways to find money, none of which include the bank until the second phase. So Finding money is easy because it's all around you. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your coworkers, talk to all the people that you surround yourself with day in and day out and never, ever, ever ask them for money. Present an opportunity to them. If you get good at presenting opportunities, oh, showing the facts, the opportunity will sell itself. Do the takeaway, present an opportunity. And then when they're excited about it and they say, okay, well, when are we doing this? Well, I don't have a deal right now, but when I get one, you'll be the first call. That's the takeaway. So you present an opportunity, you get them excited because everybody needs an opportunity. And you also got to change your mindset. One big thing about money is so many people are in that mindset. I need money. I need money. I, I don't have any. I need to get money. You need to start yeah. getting into the mindset that you have the greatest thing that everybody else wants. You have a real estate opportunity and that person over there, you know, they have the money and you know, because they have the money, you can change their life. Start thinking more what you can do for them versus what they can do for you. Once you change that mindset and you start focusing your opportunity on what that opportunity means to them, $500 a month, $1,000 a month extra in their household, what does that mean to them? Well, that might mean a couple extra dinners for them and their family. It might need a, mean another vacation for their family. It might mean one of their car payments is paid for. It might mean way more than that. But when you focus your opportunity on how it benefits someone else, not how it benefits you, you start having money flowing to you. So there's such simple things that we've learned by asking for money hundreds of times and by being told no hundreds of times and by failing so many times I can't even count. Once you fail enough times, you start figuring out what you actually should do and what you should do is the complete opposite of what people do do. Awesome. And you said present opportunity to people around you. So, and that could actually benefit them. And I totally agree with that. And like people that are at home, like trying to find deals. And if they actually f think they find one or they do find one, what do you think would be a good way to present the, this opportunity to either people around them, to a hard money lender or to private money? Well, it's always easy to go to a hard money lender and you can just skip all that, that stuff. But you go to a hard money lender, they, they have 
millions, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to lend, and they have to put that money on the street. It's a job, but they're going to be expensive. They're going to have rules and things that might not work with your model. So hard money lenders are easy. You just go there, you present them the opportunity, you present the data that they want, and they'll more than likely fund your deal. Private investors, how we do it is when we present an opportunity, we structure our deal. So we take our deal and we put it all on paper. Photos, sometimes we'll get an appraisal or a CMA from a realtor to show the values to support what we tell them that it's worth. All the, the pretty stuff, we make it look very professional, almost like a marketing kit, like a three ring binder. And then we basically call that person. And a lot of times these are people, like I said, they're not the people driving the fancy cars, living in the big houses. These are just your, your average people, your neighbors, yeah. the people you work with. You go to them and you don't even have the opportunity. You start talking about the deal that you just found, the amazing deal that you're going to make a ton of money that you're so excited about. You talk about your deal and the opportunity that it's presenting for you. And you don't talk about it like they're involved. You're just like, oh man, you got to hear about this deal. I just picked this deal up. Here's the numbers. This is what it's going to be. This is going to be the profit. It's freaking amazing. I'm going to kill it with this deal. You should get into deals like this. You, this is what you should be doing. This stuff's fun. This stuff's amazing. Like that would change your life, man. You should get into this. And they're just like, well, I don't know about it. I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've learned, I've learned from some of my mentors. I've read a lot of books. I mean, well, if you ever want, like we could do a deal together. If you're ever interested in getting into this, we could deal like this. We could get into it together. You know, if you're interested, just let me know. No, not trying to say anything. Like I'm that. doing this deal yeah. myself, but if you want in on this, let's chat. Well, yeah, I want in. Tell me about it. Well, all right, well, let me, let's set up a time. Don't ever do it right there because then they know it's a loaded gun. Then you just say, well, let's set up a time. Let's grab a coffee and I'll, I'll show you the opportunity. And you sit down and then you pull out that three ring binder and you start flipping through, showing them all the stuff and the numbers and the profits. And then you basically show, here's what I'd be willing to do with you. Not, hey, do you want to do this? And how would you want to do it? Own the conversation, control the conversation. And to control the conversation is you tell them what the opportunity is for them. And the opportunity for them might be, I'm gonna, I'll pay you 10%. You put the money up for the deal. I'll put you in a first position mortgage or deed of trust. So you definitely have like the first right on this property. If something goes bad, this thing will be yours. If I don't pay you, this thing's yours. But I'm going to pay you 10%. That's going to be this much money per month. And if this thing takes us six months, dude, you just made 8000 bucks for doing nothing. You literally got to sleep and make money while you sleep. I'm the one that's going to do all the work. And if you want to come in and check the deal out, come on anytime, man. I'll be happy to have you out. That's presenting an opportunity. That's awesome. I like the fact that you just like, you put the carrot in front of them, but mm -hmm. you don't push it. And they you take the carrot it. away. Like, yeah, carrot? Exactly. Uh, can't have so it yet. Carrot, but then you, yeah, you just started with, that's a really good idea. It's such a good psychology just to present them like this, but don't push it. It works so well. And it yeah. hasn't just worked for us. It works for our students. I have not had it fail once. It almost scares me because we've done this so many times and it just works so many times that I'm just like, man, is it going to work again? And it does. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. That's a really good way to present it. And actually, so what we can learn from this is actually be prepared. Don't push the opportunity. Just talk about it. And you even got me excited just by the fact that you, you were like, hey, this is such a good deal. I, I got excited. I was like, hey, well, where's the deal? So be enthusiastic about it. Yeah, it's a, such a good tip. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm always excited to talk about money. It just fires me right up if you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Awesome. Do you think actually the fact that you, uh, did you see a difference from before HGTV and after? Did you see a difference? Did it make like a difference in your business? Uh, like when people started to recognize you and stuff? Yeah, it made a huge difference, but not all good things. So you know, good. after our show aired, we all of a sudden realized that we had a lot of haters and they always say, you know, when the haters come out, you know, you made it. So we definitely had haters, people I never even knew existed, people that I don't know that all of a sudden thought they knew everything about me. So that came out. And then the other thing that happened is every single deal we do, the building inspectors were there before we even got started. So it was just like we became a target for building inspections. And that's fine because we do everything by the book. We do everything permitted and insured and licensed, but still it's like, you don't want, building inspectors like crawling all over making your job difficult so that happened but some of the other good things that came about is when we were you know doing our marketing and getting deals when we got those deals and people found out who we were because we're very transparent they look us up and they see that we're credible they see that we had the show they want to meet with us 
You know, they want to talk to us. They want us to do their house. They want to see the house transform. So it helped a lot from acquisition side because we had that credibility, that instant credibility. And for me with money school and my speaking business, I mean, it's helped tremendously. It gets me on stages all over the world. So it's helped a lot. It's also been hard. I mean, there's some things that I, I don't like about the fact of the notoriety, but you know, you just, you, you harness the good in it and you don't focus on the bad. So actually one thing we can get from that is, like you said, focus on the good and you can implement that to anything. Just focus on what's good about it. You know, like seeing the glass half full because whatever you do, there's two side, you know, of the metal. So just try to see the, the good side. I agree. Awesome. And um, I know that you, you and your wife work together in the business. We do. We do. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. Since 2014, we've always built this business together and she has an office right next to mine. And when she wants something from me, she screams, you know, yells through the wall and vice versa. So it's a unique thing. But what's so unique about like the husband wife team is she's very good at certain aspects. Like she does all the design. She's out with the teams, out with the contractors day in and day out. She, she heads up, uh, she's COO of of our, our uh, wholesale division called Resolved. And then I focus on money school. I focus on money and act like funding the deals. I focus on some of the, the CFO operations, the financial aspects of the business. And, I, and I'm the vision. I, I focus on like where the businesses are going and you know, relaying that to the team. So it's definitely got its challenges, but I wouldn't change it for the world. It's, it's amazing. Awesome. Uh, you know, you, you, the one bad thing is just when you go home, work goes home with you. I mean, that's yeah. the game. True. And uh, what do you think? You talked a bit, a little bit about vision. Like, did you always had that vision of like having multiple companies uh, working hard like this? And even before you, you talking about you had like that snowboard shop, that the financial uh, business, and then you started flipping. So, did you always had that vision of having multiple companies like this? That's a that's a great question. Yeah, I, I really have. I've always been a visionary. Yeah. I've always dreamed way bigger than I should be dreaming for you know the resources I had available. I just I want huge things. I, I grew up with, you know, a great life. I mean, I had a great upbringing, but you know, I never really had much. And mm -hmm. it's not that I want things. I'm not materialistic. That's a weird thing. A lot of people are like, oh, you make all this money. Like, why don't you have uh, the Lamborghini? Why don't you have the big house? And I mean, we have a, a beautiful house. It's a very modern, modest house, but we just aren't into the material things. We're about using money as a tool, not so much using it to flaunt. So that's, that's one thing I, I've always been a visionary and I, I want big things. Like I, I, people always are like, Oh God, you made it. I'm like, dude, I didn't make it. Like my journey's just beginning because I got way bigger aspirations. Like I want to change people's lives. I want to change a lot of people's lives. I want to travel around and help people that are in need because the problems we face, these problems I've talked about on this podcast, like they're baby problems. Like, thank God we get to solve those problems. You remember that from Kent? Like that's such, I, I say that all the time now. I love it. Thank God these are the problems we get to solve. So true. Thank God we're not out there, you know, trucking four miles in hot desert just to get water out of a dirty stream to feed our family water and then walking back a mile to do that or four miles to do that. Those are real problems. We don't have real problems. We have baby problems. And vision is all you've got. So charge at it. Chase your and, dreams. And I, I want to dig a little bit into like business wise. Mm -hmm. Like you always had that vision, but how did you implement your vision? Like what was your process? Like who did you hire first? How did you structure the business at first? Sure. I mean, I, I, in the beginning, I was like the jack of all trades, right? I could do everything better than everybody else. That was my mindset. I, I was a type. I just, I wanted to do it all myself. And then I started realizing that I can't grow without getting people. So I bring people in and I would train them. The first people I always bring in, in any organization is sales because without sales, your business isn't going to grow. Good so point. it's always sales. And in today's business, we, you know, our, our administrator and our director are key because they basically handle all the work that, you know, allows was me and Larissa to kind of go out there and build the company. And without us building, the company itself couldn't run. So the other thing I always say in building a business is very early on, get yourself a really good bookkeeper or learn bookkeeping because that's a key thing. You got to learn. So many businesses get started and they know nothing about the finance. They know nothing about the bookkeeping or anything like that. You're going to fail or you're going to get yourself in hot water with taxes if you don't learn that first. No. So get a good bookkeeper, get a good CPA or tax accountant to make sure that your taxes are getting filed and make sure that the, the ground, the foundation of your business is set up 
properly. And sometimes it's not very hard. And also the biggest thing I say to anybody looking to be an entrepreneur is understand that you're never ever going to be too high on the totem pole, too big on, you know, or too, you know, mighty to go and clean a toilet. You have to be willing to go in and clean a toilet, plunge a toilet, do anything you have to do. No matter how big your company is, you better be ready to jump down into the trenches and show your team that you are never, ever too big to go and do their job and make sure you do their job better than they can do it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Actually, I would, I would translate that to like take responsibility, whatever it is, take responsibility and do it. Just don't be like, hey, I, I'm not the one who should do this. No, just, just do it then you know, move on. Yeah. That's awesome. So you said sale, how, like, how does your sale team work? Like how do they get lead and how do they work? Uh, so how did you train them? Like, could, could you talk a little bit about this? Do you want, want me to talk about it in today's business or just? Yeah, well, actually, yeah. In today's business. Cause I want to, so, I want to have things that people can implement sure. right now. So these are, these are easy things and I think everybody knows this, but we live in a digital age. We live in an information yeah, age. So much. I got to be honest, like most of our marketing and our leads come in through social media. It's, we spend an ungodly amount of time, money, energy, effort in our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I mean, we're constantly, constantly creating content putting content out, that stuff just doesn't magically happen. And coming up with ways to help other people. The thing about social media is you can't just start posting, oh, I got this great thing to sell. I got that great thing to sell. Hey, sign up with me. Everybody will see you as a fraud and they won't even open your stuff. You have to provide massive value, not just a little value, massive value. So mm -hmm. that's what we do. We literally, and, and I learned this 2012, a mentor of mine told me, he said, you have to give your best stuff away for free. And I looked at him crazy, like almost you know, one of those head turn things. I said, what? Yeah. If I give away everything for free, nobody's going to want to hire me. Nobody's going to want to bring me in to do anything. A lot he's of like, people are like this. That, that's you're wrong. touching a really good yep. point there. You're absolutely wrong. If you don't give your best stuff away for free, you'll, you just won't get traction. And here's the thing he said, he says, if you give your best stuff away for free, a couple people will take everything you give and they will never need you. And you have to accept that, that some people will never need you because you gave them everything they could ever need or want. But 99% of the people you're talking to will never know how to apply that knowledge. They will take that knowledge. It will, fan, it will make them so just intrigued with you that they will not even know it, but they will need you to show them how to apply knowledge. Because, you know, the one thing about today's world is being in an information world is we know the price of everything and the value of nothing. You can oh, get knowledge. A nugget right there. Yeah, you, you, you know the price really of good. everything and the value of nothing. We can get knowledge for free. You want to learn how to flip houses, how to wholesale, how to do the burst strategy and build rental portfolios. You want to learn how money works. It's all there. Bigger pockets, YouTube, Google, everything's there for free. That's and all what I think that everybody, yep, everybody everywhere is free over there. It so. is free. Everything's free. And I urge every single person to go out there, gather as much free information and then come back to me in a year and tell me if you're successful. You will not be successful. Less than 1% of those people will ever make it because they don't know how to apply that knowledge that free knowledge, they have no clue how to apply it in a systemized method to get results. And that I, is what makes the difference. So if we put everything out there for free, the best stuff for free, those people will be attracted to us because we will then show them how to apply that knowledge. Awesome. Two things about this because it, it, it's, it's really good. And actually a lot of people don't think that there is value because they don't pay for it. You're right. And I, I see the same people over and over in the, uh, you know, meetings or, uh, courses and stuff. I see the same people going there over and over. And I'm like, wh why? What are you doing here? Just stop, stop learning and oh, just you're start so doing. Right. <laughs> so right. I call it paralysis by analysis. They yeah. like get so much information that their head's going to explode and they just don't do anything with it. Nothing. All that time wasted. And I don't know about you or any of this audience that's watching this. Time is the most valuable thing you have. And if oh, you want to spend your time sitting out there watching everything for free, thinking that you're going to save a buck by getting it all for free instead of paying a mentor and a coach that can really change your life, you're going to go out there and do it for free. Good luck. Good luck. It won't work. Exactly. Exactly. Like you said, you don't need someone to you know, to teach you out, you know, to teach you the, the knowledge because it's for free, but you might need someone to, you know, help you doing stuff, keep you accountable. That's really good. And that actually, right. you know, the event that we met actually, you know, I, I can't say right now that it changed my life, but it switched. Like uh, 
I, I had a light bulb in my head, like you said. Time is now, so you, you can't waste it. I wish I had my watch on. I always yeah. have that watch that says, it just says now. It doesn't even tell the time. Well, I mean, and so many people just, they, especially like the younger generation, and I mean, I'm 41, so I'm not old, but the younger generation is they don't understand wisdom. Wisdom is what you pay for. Wisdom is the person that's failed over and over. And because of those failures, they know how to succeed and they know how to help other people succeed. That's true wisdom. Yeah. Knowledge is great, but knowledge is nothing without wisdom. Yeah, exactly. So true. Because, I, I mean, we can talk about this for hours and hours, but I mean, guys at home, just take action. It doesn't matter. Just fail, take action, do something. You know, stop reading, stop learning. Everything is free. So just learn little stuff. Just learn one little thing and apply it. That's it. And then move on and apply something else. It's as easy as that. There's no secret formula or anything. Like people come up to me like, ah, how did you do it? I'm like, well, Everything is for free. I just learn it like I, I learn it free on with books, with podcasts and stuff. So I'm trying to give the same thing. I'm trying to give give back to people and just try to help them implement stuff because yeah, that's what they need. That's what that is awesome. that is, and, and everybody's going to need a mentor. I mean, even still today, you know, with our success, we still spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in learning. And going to seminars and going to events and paying for masterminds and paying for things like boardroom where we can keep surrounding ourselves around people that think even bigger than we do. People that think so big that it literally would scare anybody. Those are the people you got to surround yourself with. People that scare you and how big they think. Those yeah. are the people you want to be around because those are the people like Steve Jobs. The ones yeah. crazy enough to change the world are the ones that do. They totally change your perception actually. Totally. So, so it's really really good what you just said right there guys at home take some notes surround yourself with people that have done it and just just surround yourself with them either if you have to pay for it or just you have to hustle for it but do it that that changed your perspective so much that's really good what you said there so we talked Thanks. about we talked about the past the present now i want to talk a little bit about the future like where are you going where do you think the market's going and uh, what is your vision for the future? Oh, that's, that's easy. So where is the market going? Well, I can tell you right now, just like weather patterns, like all these storms we've been seeing here in Buffalo, the weather's been rough. Well, there's a storm coming in the financial markets. Yeah. The markets work in patterns, very predictable and organized patterns. We are 10 years out from 2008. The market is going to have a correction, uh, some type of correction. It's not going to be pretty. And you have to prepare for that storm because you know what? There's more opportunity ever in the down times, when things are terrible, when things fall apart, that's when opportunity is born. So all I'm doing right now is I'm getting my balance sheet right. I'm getting all the cash we can put together and lined up literally just in a pretty little row right in front of me where when the market goes down, we are going to be ready to pounce. We're going to be ready to take action. We're going to be ready to go out there and buy up the things that we can't buy right now, things that we can't really make sense of the numbers on. We'll just wait. We're not buying a whole lot right now. We're doing a lot of wholesale, but we're buying very, very few properties because the, the, the margins are so thin. So when this storm comes, Comes, you have to be ready for it. And that's what we're doing. So that's the real estate side. The other side is I also understand the markets extremely well. And I understand how money's going to operate. When markets go down, money will always, always, always find the safest route to go. Whether that safe route is cash, sometimes it's bonds. It won't be this time because bonds go down with rising rates or yep. real estate. So I want to be in a position that when this thing goes down, that I am the leading expert in money and showing people how money really works, not how they think it works, not what their advisor tells them, how it really works and how they can make money when the market goes down. And I want basically to help people so that they don't have to ride a 2008 type recession. So they don't have to lose everything that they made and then fight the next five years to build it all back just to lose it again in the next drop. I want to teach people that and I want to do it from stages. I want to be the leading national world recognized expert in how money really works. So that is my pie in the sky dream and it's happening because if you put thoughts out that it's how the universe works. If you put your thoughts out there, those things become real. They happen. So that's that. And then we've got our software that we just launched, Flipping Edge. It's the most incredible software. So we're putting a lot of energy and effort into marketing that. And I just want to keep building up my rental portfolio because there's nothing more powerful in real estate than making money while you sleep from passive yep. income. And uh, that's, that's my big focus is so money school and getting noticed as that. 
the wholesale operations and being ready to basically pounce when the markets go down, the software, and then our holding companies. Awesome. Awesome. Chris, that was amazing. Thank you for everything. Thank you for sharing. Guys at home, if you, if you liked it, you know, if you, if you got some golden nugget out of it, if you got some good knowledge, you know, you want to know more about Chris, because I know we, we talked for a bit, but there's so much more to know. You know, so if, if people want to know more about you, how today, how can they find you? Sure. I mean, I'm all over social media, so you can just, you know, go on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and just type in Chris, C-H-R-I-S. Last name is N-A-U-G-L-E. Or go to my website, chrisnoggle.com. And also our company's website is flipoutacademy.com. So you can check me out in any of those. And uh, I'm pretty transparent. So if you want to know kind of my background, my past, just check it out on there. You are. And guys, I mean, I'm out of the blue. Like I just came up to that guy and I was like, hey, my name is Oliver. Like, nice to meet you and stuff. And, you know, you were genuine. And like, so, I mean, you, you can come up to this guy. Don't be, you know, don't be scared. Yeah, seriously. The most successful people are always the most accessible as well. Awesome. And the other thing I forgot to mention yep. is obviously, you know, if anyone wants to check out our podcast, the Real Estate Money School. Absolutely. And awesome. And you'll be on that. Well, I think you're already on and we've got round two coming. So it's going to be quite amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So just watch this podcast, this video. You can watch HGTV. You can get a hold of him on his website, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and all that stuff. You want to be inspired, follow him. You know, Chris, this was amazing. Thank you very much. And I hope, guys, you got something really good out of this. And if, if it's the case, just share it with a friend, share it with people. And you can ask me a question. You can ask Chris a question if you got anything that you want to know. So on this, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Chris. That was amazing. And hope to hear more about you in the future. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Ciao, guys. Bye.